The KRC Farm and Food Conference was held on November 16th and 17th in Wichita, Kansas. The theme was Framing Our Future. What is right about food, farming, and communities in Kansas? I would like to introduce Saturday morning keynote speaker David Montgomery, University of Washington professor and author of Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, and The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health. His topic is Growing a Revolution. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to come back to Wichita and to talk to you. And the first question I have is, how do you get a PC to show my uh, talk? <laughs> is that just, do all I have to do is press this? Not quite. Not quite? <laughs> See, I can change these, but say, that's not... <laughs> oh, okay, I thought we were ready to go. Hey, David, the sound doesn't come back here very well, so could you hold the mic up close? How's that? Thank you, that's not good. Is that worse? <laughs> Better? Close. Close. Best? Yes. <laughs> All right, I'll, I will snuggle up to the microphone. <laughs> Great, okay. And is, is there any way to maybe like dim the lights up um, here so that people can see the slides better? That would be great because you don't need to look at me. The slides are the important part. Um, but what I'm going to do today is I will give you a talk that uh, tries to go through a bit about why a geologist like myself, because I'm not a farmer, I'm not a biologist, um, I'm a geologist. I studied rocks as an undergraduate, and I was trained to think that soil was the stuff that covered up all the good stuff I was supposed to be looking at. And it took me a long time, sort of halfway through my career, uh, of actually studying erosional processes and what shapes landscapes, to start coming around to thinking that, oh no, no, the soil is actually the really, is the important part for human societies. And at, over the last 10 years or so, um, I've written, or helped write those three books that uh, Mary mentioned, that are up on the screen, and I can give you sort of a quick tour through the thinking of a geologist that came to appreciate not only soil and how it's built, but how we could rebuild it fairly rapidly and the role that farming played both in the destruction of the world's soils and could play in the rebirth of the world's soils as fertile, uh, productive entities. If you're into Twitter, feel free to live tweet this. Uh, Anne and I took the plunge into social media a couple of years ago and we're sort of fairly active on that. If you want to be informed of things that develop in regenerative agriculture or the microbial uh, world and microbiomes of plants or in people, <coughs> the kind of stuff I'll be talking about this morning and that Anne will pick up and talk about this afternoon, feel free to follow us and interact with us. Um, we'll see if I can make this go. No, but this is <coughs> not advancing anything. There oh wait, so okay, but uh, so I hit backwards to go forward. Got it. Um, but what, so what I want to start with is basically a quiz. Why do I start with the quiz? Because I'm a university professor. I get to do this for a living. The quiz is actually fairly simple. There's one question. Which planet would you rather live on? The blue one or the red one? And why? Because you always have to fill in why for, to get full credit. Blue one, red one. I go for the blue one. Some of my students pick the red one. <laughs> go figure. Um, but so why, what makes Earth habitable? Why is it such a good place for the abode of life? Well, its color is the first giveaway. It's blue. It's got free water on it. There's some free water on Mars, but there's not a lot. There's also an atmosphere. You can see the clouds up there. So you can kind of see the, the foremost evidence just from the picture. There's no clouds on Mars. There's no atmosphere. Those two things help make Earth habitable, but the third one, that you really can't see very well in this picture, but it does kind of show up in that little brown stuff underneath, is that Earth is the only planet that we know of that has soil. There's nowhere else in the universe that we know of that has soil. Geologists, uh, when they study Mars, argue about whether there's soil up there, but it's all semantics. About, it's about definitions of what is soil. And if you think of soil as the, de as the merger, the, the marriage, if you will, of biology and geology, of the world of life and sort of the fossil world of the dead stuff that makes up plants, the mineral world, that gives you a pretty good definition of what soil is. It's the, it's the interface between the geological world and the biological world. And we know of nowhere else in the universe where there's life at this point yet. So we've got a sample of one in terms of the importance of soil for supporting life in the universe, and Earth is it. So anyway, hopefully you picked the blue planet on that quiz. You can grade yourselves, there's no extra credit. Um, but why would a geologist 
be concerned, as I am, about the state of the world's soils after having looked into it for a while. This map, so sort of the UN map of global soil degradation from a decade or so ago, is uh, a sense on it. You'll notice there's an awful lot of yellow, sort of degraded soil, and red, very degraded soils on that map. Now the first thing I'll say about this map is it's a very coarse representation. There's lots of arguments equivalent about, well, what does degraded or very degraded mean, and so forth. But I like this map because it's, it shows the global pattern. The other thing that allows me to do is to say that if you went into any one of those big red zones on there, places where the land has been degraded enough to actually affect agronomic productivity if it wasn't for supplementation, you can find farms that are rebuilding fertile soil at what is, a, to me, as a geologist, at a frighteningly rapid pace. So I like this map because it both highlights the global dimension of soil degradation and allows me to say that you can go almost anywhere in the world in those red zones and find people who are doing the exact opposite of what you would get from the takeaway of just looking at this map. And that intrigues me. So how about if we start putting some numbers to how bad the, the, the degree of soil degradation is today. Um, David Pimentel and his colleagues at Cornell did this about, you know, what, decades ago, when they tried to integrate how much land has been taken out of production since the Second World War. And what they basically came up with is roughly 430 million hectares of arable land globally were taken out of production in the second half of the 20th century. 430 million hectares is kind of a, it's one of those like arbitrarily large numbers. It's, it's big, but how big is it? Well, it's the size of India and China combined. It is about a third of the world's cropland has been taken out of production in the not too uh, recent past. It's also a problem that is not done with. There was a UN Global State of the Soil report from 2015, just a couple years ago, that in the executive summary concluded that we're losing about 0.3% of our global agricultural production capacity each and every year to soil loss and degradation at a global scale. And 0.3% is one of these kind of small numbers. It's kind of like what we all get from our savings accounts these days. It's, it's kind of, it takes a while for it to add up. But if you're a geologist, you look at a number like this, and it's scary because 0.3% over 100 years is 30%. So we've already degraded roughly a third of the world's agricultural land. We're on track this century to degrade another third of the world's agricultural land, and yet we're on track to grow our population by a third. Those trends are working against each other. And at the moment, we don't have a problem feeding the world in terms of gross agricultural production. We grow enough food to feed everybody. We have a distribution problem. But you project these numbers all out into the future, and we'll have a very different problem. So it's my contention that agriculture is going to have to change this century. And I'm going to take you on a, the journey between through these three books, that if the first, oh, the next 10, 15 minutes or so is a little depressing, it's okay. <laughs> it gets better, as they say. Um, by the end of it, I hope to, that you'll share you know, a sense of optimism that this problem of global soil degradation is one we can actually fix, and we can fix it remarkably fast, and do it in ways that make farmers money. So stick with me if the next few minutes are a bit um, depressing. There we go, because we're first going to start talking about that dirt book. I wrote it about 10 years ago, and it was something that I started um, because I was very interested, having studied erosion all around the world, I was very interested in the role of soil loss and erosion in the effect, and its effects on ancient civilizations. I visited you know, ruins in, in Italy and Greece and other places, and fascinated by them, and noticed, you know, saw evidence on the ground of places where there obviously had been intensive farming, but there was no longer soil. So I spent some time to put the story together, oops, I think I advanced already through it, and Basically, the executive summary of the story is that you can make a very good case that soil erosion played a role in the demise of many ancient civilizations, ranging from uh, Mesopotamia, some of the earliest farming communities, uh, to Neolithic or Bronze Age Europe, to uh, classical Greece, Rome, the southern United States, the southeast in particular, um, Easter Island, parts of China, um, the list is actually fairly long, and I go into a lot of that in the Dirt Book. If you're a fan of history, you'd probably like that book. But the part, the thing that um, struck me about this, looking into it, is that I had always read in environmental history textbooks that it was deforestation that led to the loss of topsoil that helped to undermine the stability of ancient civilizations. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized that it wasn't 
deforestation per se that was doing it. It was actually the plow that followed. It was not the axe, but it was an agriculture that followed deforestation. And why was that the case? Because if you cut down trees and go away, they'll grow back. You have to actively endeavor to keep them off the land. And that's when you can actually start topsoil erosion that adds up over generations. So if a, if a nonfiction book can actually have a villain, the villain of the, of the dirt book was the plow. And this was not what I thought I was writing about when I started writing it. But when you look at the history, that's what comes into focus. Um, and so what is it about the invention of the plow that set the stage for the loss of topsoil on regional scales that actually impacted human societies? And if you think about it, how many of you have ever gone out to a native grassland or a native forest and seen vast tracts of bare earth? You don't see that unless you go way above timberline or you go to the poles or the deserts. Nature tends to clothe herself in plants, and there's very strong reasons for that association with healthy plants building fertile soils that promote healthy plants that build fertile soils. It goes all the way back to the, the colonization of the continents by land plants in the first place. That's when rich soils started to develop, and it formed a feedback that took off and clothed the world that we know in plants. Tillage undoes that in a single pass. It's a very, very effective means of weed control for obvious reasons in terms of it's resetting the, the stage for growing things. But it also leaves the ground surface bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind or rain. And that sets the stage for progressive ongoing topsoil loss that can really impact um, societies over time. And this slide of a, of a winter wheat field in eastern Washington, uh, the Palouse region over near Idaho, is the one that to me as a geologist really captures the problem with tillage. Because this field, uh, you'll notice, doesn't have a crop in it. It's, it was part of a uh, winter wheat fallow rotation that was plowed on both ends of it. And if you get a single rainstorm on a freshly plowed field that has any kind of a slope to it, you basically get these little channels that a geologist would call a rill, something that you could just erase with a single pass of a tractor, that on a year-to-year -year basis is something of a nuisance, but not really a major problem but they can add up. I look at this as a geologist and I see the, just the soil bleeding off the landscape. How much does it add up? Oop, going backwards here. How much does it add up to? Well, this slide basically shows you another winter wheat field in the Palouse. It was take, the slide was taken in 1961 and it shows you a fence up in there in that upper right hand corner that was the fence that the farmer that, had, that uh, owned this land built around his water cistern that he had installed in 1911 when the land surface was up there at that upper orange line. By 1961, this cliff had developed around that, um, around the, the fence line. And the only thing that had happened on that field is that it was annually, it was annually plowed, it was planted in winter wheat, wheat fallow plowed, kept that whole rotation kept happening. Uh, and those little rills would come, uh, they would form, take soil off of it. The, the, the plow would push soil down slope incrementally with each pass of it. And how high is that cliff? This little bar right there is about a one foot increment on a survey rod. That's five feet of soil erosion in 50 years. That's about a foot every 10 years, about an inch a year. There's nowhere on earth that soil forms that fast. And we've, we've looked that the, the fastest pace of natural soil formation has been documented and I know because one of my students published it, is two millimeters a year. You can't lose an inch of soil every year and sustain the soil in place. Now, you should also be sitting there going, yeah, but Dave, isn't that a pretty extreme example? And of course it is. That's why I use it. <laughs> so how typical is it? That would be the real question. You can always go find the nightmare scenario, which I've done and, and presented to you. So what would be other scenarios? How typical is it? Yeah, that's one field in one corner of one state. Well, let's look at the American Southeast and look over a couple centuries. What happened to the soil of um, the, the Piedmont country, the hill country, from Virginia up there in the upper right down to Alabama over here. So we're not looking at the coastal plain. We're not looking at the spine of the Appalachians. It's the hill country in between. And that gray noodle shows you the amount of topsoil that's been lost off this region since the advent of colonial agriculture. So about 200 years of tillage-based farming. Um, what did it do? We lost 4 to 10 inches across most of that area, more than 10 inches in some places. How big a deal was that? Well, if you go back and you actually read the journals of some of the early farmers, 
and the early plantation owners, there was only about 6 to 12 inches of rich black earth over the orange subsoil to begin with. So if we could erode off you know, a third to all of the topsoil across a region that was once one of the original breadbaskets of the early American colonies, and we could do it in just a couple hundred years, Think what the Greeks could have done with a 1,200 year run at southern Greece. Think what the Romans could have done with an 800 year run at central Italy. Put to Syria and Libya, places where there are Roman tax records of bountiful wheat harvests from places today that can barely grow anything. It wasn't the change, a changing climate that did them in at that time. That study had been, you know, those things have been looked into. It was the loss of the soil. This can really add up over broad regions and it can have a big impact on the societies that follow. Oops. I'm going to keep doing that, aren't I? Um, so I also want to talk about um, the, the other, I've talked so far about just the loss of the soil itself, but there's another element to soil degradation that went into that very first map that I showed you, and that is the loss of soil organic matter, the, the decay of um, the loss of carbon from the soil, the loss of organic matter. And this shows you two soils from fields that were side by side, from an area that was in that gray noodle that I just showed you from the American Southeast. This is from a, a, um, a farm in North Carolina where I went to uh, help work on an uh, episode of the TV show Nova a few years ago where I got a call when they're in the final stages of doing uh, a program called Making North America where they're doing the geologic history of North America and I, they called me up and said, they we're down to the final sort of production on this thing and we realized that we've kind of forgot something and we think it might be important um, what could you do about the soil in five minutes or less? Because we don't have anything in the show about it. And I was like, oh, really? Okay, you forgot the soil. And we have like a couple minutes to tell the history of soil in North America. Great. Um, I have no idea what we should do. What we came up, what I came up with, though, with the help, some help from Ray Archuleta, I think this was his idea, actually, is we went out to a tobacco field. Um, and it was actually at a, at a research farm in North Carolina, a conventional tobacco field, dug a hole, put the soil on a white tablecloth, and then went into the forest next door on a farm that had been abandoned about 100, 120 years previously, and just dug a hole, got that soil, put it out on the tablecloth, and it was completely unrehearsed, uh, and this is what we saw, this is the difference. One of them was sort of chocolate brown, had organic matter in it, had life in it that you could actually see. The other looked like beach sand from a California beach, where there was actually no living uh, organisms that we could see in it. Uh, and there's a reason that looks like beach sand. It is beach sand. It's 10 million year old beach sand. It looks just like it was in when it was geologically deposited. What's missing is all the organic matter. And that's a direct consequence of how it has been farmed, how it's been treated. The only difference between these two soils was the management, was how they were treated. The parent material was the same, the climate was the same, the vegetation was different because they were treated differently. And if we look at uh, the, law, the uh, state of the topsoil across the United States today, the most recent estimate that I've seen is that we've lost about 50% of the organic matter out of our agricultural soils. That's why there was all that big yellow stuff on that early map where it looked like most of the world's farmland has been degraded. It's not because the soil is no longer there. It's because the soil is no longer as fertile as it used to be. And this has been greatly masked by our technologies and the inputs that we use but that doesn't hide the basic change that's actually happened in the landscape. You can go dig it up and look at it for yourself. And this is something that is not, um, that, that has been known for some time in terms of soil loss and degradation. Um, people looking at this today are not, you know, we didn't originally, we didn't come up with this idea. Um, people back to colonial times, some of the early uh, plantation owners that, and early figures that are sort of revered in the, the American iconography, people like George Washington noticed the degradation of the land on their plantations and were very concerned about it. Washington, for example, in a letter to Alexander Hamilton in 1796, wrote that a few years more of increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic states westward for support, whereas if they were taught to improve the old instead of going in pursuit of new and productive soils, they would make these acres which now scarcely yield them anything turn out beneficial to themselves. The idea that farming practices could degrade the land over time is not a new one. Um, Washington and his colleagues were uh, doing things that I'll sort of bring up again later in terms of looking at cover crops and crop rotations, but they were also engaged in intensive tillage and trying to find new, they, Jefferson, for example, invented a new, better plow for working on hillsides. 
They didn't quite get it right, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, they were, however, very concerned about the state of soil in, the, in North America, and Washington is basically predicting in this statement that the future of American society lay in going west of the Appalachians because we had degraded the eastern seaboard. And this is essentially what happened. This is partly what moved my family out of the southeast and started us along a course that ended up with me uh, being in the, the far left corner of the country. So I still haven't answered the question that I posed to you about, well, how extreme was the example that I looked at earlier? I'm an academic, so how do I address stuff like that? I go to the library, and I dig up data, and I try and see, you know, is there any evidence to support the argument that I made? Um, and before I published the dirt book, uh, I wanted to actually sort of evaluate, is there data today that suggests that erosion rates off of plowed fields are high enough that you could actually invoke that mechanism for explaining the loss of topsoil in ancient civilizations? They did, we didn't have people measuring the, you know, the sediment flux off of Roman fields or doing water quality in the Greek, in, in the Greek rivers. Um, we have to triangulate with archaeology and visiting and seeing if the soil is still there or not. There's a lot of extrapolation to those kinds of arguments. Today, though, we have data like this. So I basically went to the library and I vacuumed up all the data I could find back in 2007 when I was finalizing the book. And I spent about a month in the library, three weeks, four weeks. And why did I do that? It's all the time I had. Um, so I vacuumed up everything that I could get. And this is what I can't, oops, that's not what I came up with. This is what I came up with. I'm going to boil it down to a single table. Um, if you're interested in all the data that underlies this, go to the, the paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. There's an Excel spreadsheet where every study has been summarized. Nobody ever needs to do this exercise again. If you do it and you add, you know, grab my spreadsheet, add to it, then send it back to me with more data in it, please. Um, but so what I did is up there at the, on the left-hand side, those show you the types of measurements that are made. The numbers in parentheses are the number of peer-reviewed academic studies that the averages on the right are drawn from. So you can read this as saying for conventional erosion rates, which by conventional I mean tillage-based erosion, as everything from small fields in the developing world to large mechanized operations in um, the developed world, the average or the median uh, rate of erosion so the erosion rate for which half the values were higher and half were lower, so it's just the one in the middle, uh, was about a millimeter and a half a year. Now, a millimeter and a half sounds like another one of these really low numbers, unless you're a geologist. Your fingernails grow faster than a millimeter and a half a year, at least mine do. Um, San Andreas Fault moves faster, you know, 40 times faster than a millimeter a year, and I've never seen it move. I don't want it. Um, but it adds up. At that pace of a millimeter and a half a year, it takes just 20 years to lose an inch of soil. That's fast. Now, if you compare that number to the rates at which soils are produced, or the rates they erode under native vegetation, you're dealing with a percent of a millimeter a year. You know, 100 times less, or more. Rates of natural soil production, a couple percent of a millimeter a year. Um, Long-term geological erosion rates, the rates that continents erode over long periods of time. It's about the same as the rates soils are produced and soil erodes under native vegetation. And it's actually reassuring that those three numbers are about the same. Why? Because one of our first order observations in this world, as I mentioned earlier, is that it tends to be covered with soil. If, if the geological rate of soil erosion was faster than the rate it was built, it would be stripped down to bedrock quick smart. If the rate of soil building was much faster than the rate of soil erosion, we'd have a lot more than the typical one to three feet thick of soil that we tend to have in most parts of the world. Uh, those numbers have been in balance for most of geologic history. They're not today on our agricultural lands. The good news is buried down there in that bottom number, which I've also painted blue because it's kind of like those other blue numbers. And that's the rate of erosion under no-till agriculture from the 40-some-odd studies that I was able to find uh, eight years ago. I could probably supplement this now greatly and get a better number, but that it's still going to be one of those blue numbers because no-till greatly reduces the pace of erosion. So here lies both the good news and the bad news. The good news is that we know how to farm in ways that can restrict the loss of the soil to a pace that's kind of close to the pace that soils build. The bad news is that we tend to call those practices alternative agriculture. So I've also given you all the data that you need to calculate for yourself 
what the long longevity of an agricultural society is. So, if you take that net loss of about a millimeter a year of soil, and I could argue for a millimeter and a half, I could argue for half, you know, half that again, if I wanted to be um, liberal with the estimate, but let's be conservative. So we'll go with net loss of roughly a millimeter a year, we could lose a half meter to one meter thick hill slope soil in just 500 to 1,000 years. For agricultural civilizations around the world, you kind of find that they tend to last about that long, you know, plus or minus 50% or so. I'm a geologist, so that's pretty damn close. <laughs> but there's a few major exceptions. And those major exceptions, which I hope you're thinking of, are things where farming's been sustained for thousands of years. Like in Mesopotamia, like along the Nile River, like the Tigris and the, you know, the Tigris and the Euphrates in Mesopotamia, like the Indus and the Brahmaputra in India, the big rivers of lowland China. These are places where farming has been sustained for thousands of years, the early hydraulic civilizations that, we're, that we learn about in school. Now, why were they able to actually sustain farming for, for millennia, where other societies were able to sustain it for centuries before they ran out of their soil? Well, because they were developed on major river floodplains. And that one word, floodplain, has the answer in it. Because what happens on a floodplain? It floods. And what do the floodwaters bring other than the water? Soil, sediment, silt. And how thick is a grain of sand? It's about a millimeter, plus or minus 50%. Two millimeters is a coarse grain of sand, half a millimeter is a fine grain of sand. So that long-term agriculture erosion rate under plow-based agriculture, about a millimeter and a half a year, you could completely offset that by depositing one grain of sand every year on a floodplain. And floodplains tend to be inundated every year. All you have so the places where we've been able to sustain agriculture over the long run with the kinds of implements that were first developed for tillage are places that are geographically resilient to those processes because nature's replenishing the soil at about the pace that we're using it up. You take that balance and try and apply it on a hillside where you don't have that same pace of soil building, it's only going to work for so long. That was the point of the dirt book. So, that concludes the depressing part of the talk. <laughs> because it started to actually sort of add, um, raise questions with both Ann and I about can we actually reverse this problem? Is soil degradation an inevitable part of the human existence on this planet, which means we, our civilizations have a built-in life cycle? Or can we learn to break free of that cycle? Um, can we reverse the historical pattern? And this is a question that I started wrestling with uh, as I was finishing the dirt book. And literally as I was finishing that dirt book, Ann and I bought a house in North Seattle, and the answer to the question started to become clear in my mind, um, not because I went to the library and got more data, but because Ann started restoring the soil in our yard. Because she's a biologist. I have a brown thumb. You give me, I'm not allowed to have office plants anymore. <laughs> Ann has a green thumb. She, she, I call her a plant whisperer. Um, you'll meet her this afternoon when she gets in from Denver, but um, that's her up there. But we wrote a book called The Hidden Half of Nature that, that documented our experience restoring our yard in North Seattle. And it was the experience that turned me from a pessimist, after writing that first book, into an incipient optimist in thinking that we could rebuild the fertility of the world's farmlands and do so remarkably fast. Um, and it was really taking this yard, which is our yard in Seattle, our house is over there on the right, this is uh, what we bought uh, you know, a few years ago now, um, and it had a lawn covering the side yard that Anne thought would make a great sort of place to build the garden of her dreams. She'd always garden the, the apartments that we had in graduate school and so forth, you know, the, whatever ground she could get access to, she would cover with plants and grow food on. Um, and so this looked like a great place until we pulled the lawn off and we discovered we had this sort of, you know, rich black soil that would be the envy of you all. <laughs> <laughs> no, Seattle was covered by glacial till and we call it, lovingly call it, nature's concrete. Uh, it's basically bits of Canada that were scraped off by a mile-high wall of ice, bulldozed down over the Puget Lowland, then overrun by that mile-high wall of ice, compressing it into stuff that's hard to get a shovel into. Um, so we pulled the, the lawn off, realized that we didn't have soil, we had dirt. Um, there was, was not a single worm in it, there, was no, there were no life forms, 
it was not what we had imagined. And if you're sitting there wondering, why didn't a geologist and a biologist dig a soil pit before they bought the place? Well, that's a damn good question. I don't have an answer for that one. The good news is Ann didn't think to do it either, so I'm off the hook. Um, so what happened? Um, it's basically over the next 10 years, and Ann will tell you more about this story this afternoon, uh, but this is basically the soil that we started with. It had about 1% organic matter. This is the soil that we have today. It's got about 10% organic matter. And the way that we fixed our soil was essentially composting and mulching. We don't have livestock. I'm not sure the city of Seattle would allow us to. <laughs> um, and we basically, as Ann will tell you about, we used you know, whatever sources we could get of organic matter in the urban environment. Things from the composted herbivore turds from the Seattle Zoo to uh, you know, coffee grounds to our own kitchen scraps. Basically, we fed the soil. And we noticed it after a couple years, starting to get darker, to improve. The plants were starting to really take off. And we got into thinking about, oh, what's driving this? Why is just adding this organic matter to the surface of the soil resulting in such a rapid restoration of fertility to the land? And that led us to the world of microbial life. Because Anna is the kind of biologist that studied macroscopic forms, salmon, desert tortoises. And I'm a geologist. I studied rocks. We are not trained to think about microbes. And yet, the more we looked into what was actually building the soil in our yard, we realized it was... Adding all that organic matter was bringing the missing component back into our soil, bringing life back into our soil. And it was the foundation for that was the microbial life that was breaking down that organic matter. So the archaea and bacteria and fungi um, and protists, maybe even the viruses were helping. Uh, but this got us into looking into the micro microbial life and the world of the soil food web. As we were adding all this compost and mulch to the, to the yard, but it was the organisms within the soil that was converting that, or, that once living organic matter back into materials that could be reprocessed into new life, into forms that could be soluble and taken back up by plants. And if you think about what is it that a plant needs to make its body, it gets the carbon from the atmosphere, it gets oxygen and hydrogen from the process of photosynthesis where it merges CO2 with H2O, carbon dioxide and water through photosynthesis. That's only four elements. There's an awful lot of more elements that go to make up a plant, or a person, or a cow for that matter. All those elements ultimately came out of rocks. How do you get elements out of rocks? Ever take a rock and go leave it on the sidewalk somewhere and see how fast it breaks down? Your grandkids will be continuing the experiment for you. It takes forever. But if you bury it in the soil, and you cover it with microbes that exude acids, and they can start breaking it down, they are the miners that are getting all those elements out of the soil particles and get them into biological forms that once they're consumed become things that other plant, other things can take up. So the things that are eating the compost, the bacteria and the fungi, get eaten by nematodes and protozoa and microarthropods, and those things poop out the remains of those microbes, and that's a lot of what makes soil fertile, is cycling that material and making it available for the use of future life. Oops. And this led us to thinking about the diet of plants. And Anne will go much more into this this afternoon, uh, but it led us to start thinking about, oh, there's these two basic ways to think about uh, how you feed a plant. And as a geologist, I'd never really thought about plants having a diet before. Now I'm absolutely convinced that the diet of plants actually makes a difference for the quality of our diet, but we'll get there later. Um, so if you think about how a plant is growing, uh, a plant that's growing in degraded organic matter poor soil doesn't invest all that much in its roots. Anne will go in more into the mechanics of this and the, the, the connections to the microbial world this afternoon. But suffice it to say that um, a plant grown in poor soil can actually be grown to have a high yield and be big if you add the major elements. Things we think of as standard fertilizers, N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And sometimes sulfur, sometimes calcium, but sort of major elements. If you add all the major elements a plant needs, you can get a good, decent yield and it can be big. But it's not necessarily going to have the mineral micronutrients that that biology, the soil biology, provides to the plant. And Anne will describe the mechanics of that this afternoon. Um, and you also won't be getting as many of the beneficial microbial metabolites that turn out to be essential for plant defense. So it turns out that by, in the 20th century with our adoption, of tillage and fertilizer and agrochemical intensive agriculture, what we've done 
is we've essentially removed from the system the operation of processes, microbial processes, that bolster the nutrition of plants and bolster their defensive systems. I don't think it's a coincidence that sales of pesticides went through the roof after sales of fertilizer in the early 20th century because we dismantled the defensive systems of our crops. We now understand the science at a level that we can put that argument together. We did slam the direction agriculture went in the 20th century. I'm trying to argue that we know a lot more about it now and it's time for a course correction. If you look over there on the right, so what we've labeled the soil health diet, uh, plants that are growing in organic matter rich fertile soil, put out much more extensive root systems. Those roots are interacting with soil life in ways Anne will describe. They're pushing out food into the soil to feed the microbes that in turn get things like phosphorus and nitrogen out of the soil particles, out of the organic matter if there is any in the soil, and they trade that to the plants. It's truly the original underground economy. And as you're probably guessing, I love puns, so. <laughs> Recognizing those connections though started me thinking that, oh, okay, if we could restore the soil in our yard in urban Seattle, that's one thing. You know, we've got lots of coffee shops. We've got a big zoo that's fairly close to us. Um, there's a, lots of sources of organic matter. But could you, could you actually pull off soil restoration at the scale of full-scale operational farms? And could you do it in the developing world, in the developed world? You know, can the, some of the ideas that we were starting to germinate and think about on, on our lot, can they apply in other places? And so the way for somebody like me to investigate that, since I don't have a farm, I don't have extensive experience farming, I went to people who had farms and had extensive experience farming and asked them, what did you do? So I visited farmers, regenerative farmers around the world who had restored their soil already and basically interviewed them, dug holes in their yards, in their, I'm sorry, in their fields, dug holes in their neighbors' fields to kind of do that same comparison from that uh, uh, North Carolina uh, tobacco farm. And I wrote it all up in this book, the most recent book, Growing a Revolution, um, that goes through that experience. And part of that experience came from, you know, after I wrote the dirt book, I started getting invited to farming conferences to at talk about the long-term problem of soil erosion. And at those conferences, I started meeting some of the people that I interviewed, people like Dwayne Beck and Gabe Brown, who were showing me examples of how they completely reversed the problem I was talking about. I was like, I gotta go visit their farms. I gotta see what they're doing. Um, and I did, I'll show you a few of their examples in a moment, but basically, this is the, the executive summary for visiting people on farms around the world that had already fixed their soil problem. What did they have in common? They'd adopted principles that built soil health. They, really, they essentially followed the principles of conservation agriculture, um, and they could match, they were producing yields that matched those of their conventional neighbors and um, using far less oil and far less chemical inputs, uh, which was a recipe for a more profitable farm. So what are those three principles? They're fairly simple. They're deceptively simple. Whoops. So how many, I guess there's a delay. We'll go backwards. No, we'll go forwards. We'll go backwards. There we go. They're deceptively simple. Don't disturb the ground. If you think about what would happen if somebody took a 30-story high plow and plowed through this hotel, we would be disturbed. <laughs> you know, that's what a plow does to soil life. It wrecks their home, it destroys their environment, it changes things. Maintain a permanent ground cover. Keep the ground covered in cover crops. That's not only a source of carbon to feed the soil, things like the compost and mulch Ann and I were doing in the yard, but it's also, it can protect the soil from erosion. And the third thing, diversifying crop rotations. Um, the mechanics behind that, why it's important, will be a little clearer after Ann talks. I'm sure many of you uh, know this already, but in terms of feeding different soil microorganisms, Different plants push out different compounds into the soil. They feed particular communities. So if you look at, say, just those of us in this room or, or any village or city of people on Earth, if everybody was a geologist like me, it would be utterly dysfunctional. We need diversity to play different roles so that we can get more things done together. Soil life is no different. You need a diversity to provide the benefits that bolster crop health and crop production. With, with fewer inputs. So how do we do things like that? Well, with no-till, I mean, there, there's implements, try, uh, 
you know, various manufacturers will sell you a, a seed drill or a no-till planter. Um, this shows you David Brandt modeling his. The reason I like this one is basically this side of it shows a freshly planted field. And just contrast that in your mind's eye with those tilled fields I was showing you earlier. It's like night and day. I could show that to my graduate students, crop out the top part of it, and basically convince them it was a native grassland somewhere. In terms of cover crops, there's different kinds of implements that can be used, but you know, the idea of growing more things in sequence um, and keeping the ground covered. This is Jeff Moyer from the Rodale Institute with his roller crimper that is a way to um, essentially terminate a cover crop after you plant it. Because if you plant cover crops and they go to seed, you've basically got weeds. But if you kill it before it goes to seed, you've made compost. And so I, I sort of came to the conclusion in Research and Growing a Revolution that you know, even at the level of how we think about weeds, there's a philosophical shift we need to think about. Not that they're bad, but that if you kill it before it reproduces, it's done you the favor of getting mineral elements out of the soil into a living organism that when it decays, your crops can take up as fertilizer. And again, there's nothing terribly revolutionary about that, um, unless you compare it against standard practice the world over. So the general principles of conservation agriculture, uh, what I found is they translate from one setting to another. They worked in, in equatorial West Africa, they worked in Costa Rica, they worked across North America, they worked up in Canada. They know no boundaries, climatically or politically. The specific practices that farmers used to implement each of those things varied wildly. Not only from region to region, but farm to farm. They need to be tailored and adapted to the specific setting. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, they need to be tailored and adapted to the specific setting of different farms around the world. And that's something where I think you can basically argue that in the standardization of agronomic practices that has happened over the last hundred years, we've oversimplified our understanding of the soil and we've underappreciated the ingenuity and creativity of our farmers. We need to undo both of those things. So, basically, I'll quickly introduce you to a couple of the farmers that I met. This is Dwayne Beck, who runs um, Dakota Lakes Research Farm in South Dakota through South Dakota State University. The reason I visited him first when I went around to, to visit farmers around the world is that the cover of my dirt book has a picture from the Dust Bowl. It's his neighborhood. So, I wanted to go visit and see what's happened in the in, you know, part that was an area that was the, part of the heart of the Dust Bowl. He took me on a several hundred mile uh, tour before we went to visit his research farm. I only saw three plowed fields during tillage season. The region's been transformed. It's almost all no-till now. Uh, and Dwayne has a, had a lot to do with that. Uh, he was a very early adopter of it. His story is really interesting. Um, I let him tell it in effect through, through the chapter in the book. But basically what I want to point out here is that by adopting no-till, cover crops, crops, and complex rotations, those three principles of conservation agriculture, he was able to reduce his diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide use by more than half. Those are big expenses for a conventional farm like he was running. And so when those dropped, well, what happened? So his expenses dropped. What happened to his yields? They went up. By restoring fertility to his land, he was able to use fewer inputs, grow more crops. That's the recipe right there for a more profitable farm. Even a geologist can tell you that, and I have no business sense. Um, when I left Dwayne's farm, I basically asked him, you know, you're working with large-scale mechanized farms up to 20,000 acres, so I can see you have technology that you can use to help implement this. Would this work for small-scale subsistence farms, farming in the developing world? And he said, well, don't ask me. I don't do that. Go ask this gentleman here, Kofi Boa, who um, runs the Center for No-Till Research in Kumasi, Ghana. And I, you'll notice his hat it says, got dirt, get soil. <laughs> I want one of those hats. Um, what I got out of the truck, saw him, and just realized, oh, I'm going to like this guy. Uh, he's basically transformed farming in the region around his village, uh, taking them from a, their traditional uh, slash and burn style of agriculture, which works fine if you can clear a piece of forest, farm it for two or three years, and then leave it alone for 20 or 30 years. That works. But if your population gets large enough that you have to farm the same land year after year, or you only own a piece of land that you have to farm year after year, you degrade the soil. Uh, the soils around his village were down less than 1% organic matter. 
when you started trying to convert their practices. That doesn't work very well in the tropics. Um, what he did is he converted uh, folks to no-till with cover crops. They get their diversity by planting eight or nine crops in the same field all at once. It's mostly hand-operated, it's not mechanized agriculture, so they don't have problems with harvesting when you've got eight crops in the field, you select them by hand. Um, what did that do? It shut erosion off. Look at their corn yield tripled, their cowpea yield doubled. And they did this without any fertilizer, without any pesticide, without any GMOs or patented seeds. And they did it for farmers for whom the Green Revolution just bypassed them because they don't have the money to buy fertilizer responsive crops. Yet the yield changes are as good as the Green Revolution. And they did it by changing how they think about the soil, the pra changing the practices that they implement on the land. They did it with the resources that they had. And it was transformative to the village. Um, this next gentleman that I'll show you is David Brandt, who uh, runs uh, the Brandt Family Farm near Carroll, Ohio. Uh, he is a, um, a farmer who grows, uh, he sells wheat, corn, and soybeans in the commodity markets. Uh, he's a conventional farmer in the sense that he will use um, agrochemicals when he needs to or wants to. Um, but he doesn't just grow those three crops. He also grows wildly diverse mixtures of cover crops. And this shows you sort of one of his fields in cover crops. He's showing off of a tillage radish that um, he was kind of a little surprised, I think, when I told him how much he could sell that for in the farmer's market. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to show this because notice how green his field is. Notice how yellow his neighbor's soybeans are at that same time. Um, and then notice the green stuff in those yellow soybean fields. Those are mare, glyphosate resistant mare's tails. Up to like a quarter of his neighbor's fields are covered by weeds they cannot kill. And that field there had been sprayed three times the year I took the picture. David Brandt doesn't have a weed problem. He plants them. <laughs> he calls them cover crops. And he kills them before they become a problem. And they essentially, when they rot, they nourish the, the bacteria and the fungi in his soil. And they have transformed his soil. So what, is, what does David do? Um, well, the comparison with his neighbors is his neighbors are doing full tillage with 200 pounds of nitrogen, two and a half quarts of Roundup an acre. That costs them about 500 bucks an acre. They were yielding about 100 bushels an acre in 2015 when I visited him. At four bucks a bushel, his neighbors were losing 100 bucks an acre. That sounds a lot like being a professor. <laughs> it's not, that's a terrible business model. What David, who's been doing no-till for 44 years, doing cover crops for a few decades, and, and now doing much more diverse mixtures of them, he doesn't till anymore. He uses about an eighth of the nitrogen and a fifth of the Roundup. That means he's spending about 320 bucks an acre. He, his yield was about 80% higher than the county average. He was making 400 bucks an acre when his neighbors were losing 100 bucks an acre. When I started sort of processing the economic potential of regenerative agriculture, the style of agriculture these guys are doing, and realizing that, oh, it can actually transform money-losing farms into reasonably decent profit centers, I started to go, this stuff might catch on. Uh, you know, we, we may be at a point now where the short-term economic incentives, because of the high prices of inputs and the low prices of commodity crops, are to the point where the incentive is there to slash inputs as much as possible. And we could have the short-term interests of individual farmers starting to line up with the long-term interest of society in sustaining the fertility of our land. This is why I've become something of an optimist. And this is why it worked for David Brandt. This is the soil uh, the year uh, you know, from right before I visited in 2014. He's got this rich black earth. This is the soil that his neighbor's farm had, which is comparable to what Brandt had started with in 1971 when he started um, doing no-till. Um, so you, it's that same picture from the tobacco plantation. This is what conventional agriculture has turned our soil into. This is what we can turn it back into. And, it can, and we can do it in, just, in years to decades, not centuries to millennia. Taking it from you know, 1 to 2 percent up to about 6 to 8 percent. It makes a huge difference for crops. Last guy I'll mention very briefly, since I think I'm getting close to, to the, my time allotment, is Gabe Brown. Uh, he's a, a, a regenerative rancher near Bismarck, North Dakota. And he's the guy who basically convinced me that livestock can actually be a tool of soil restoration. Um, I've done work looking at uh, gullying from cattle grazing in California back in the 19th century, 
there's no doubt that if you ever go to San Francisco and you go up to Marin County north of there, hike through the valley bottoms, those 30-foot deep trenched gullies, they form between 1880 and 1890 due to dairy grazing. And nailed that one to my PhD. So, but that left me thinking, left me thinking that, oh, cows cause erosion. That was a false conclusion. It was the ranchers that caused the erosion by mismanaging their cows. And Gabe was the guy, when I visited him, that basically convinced me that, oh no, if you actually manage the cows right, they can be a tool of soil restoration. And what he's doing is he's basically reintegrating uh, livestock into his cropping systems by having his cattle graze off the, the stubble from his cover crops and his commercial crops. He then brings the chickens in. So sort of a Joel Salatin-like affair. Um, but the key thing is they're reintroducing animal husbandry and cropping. And I like to think of cattle now, managed the right way, as essentially self-propelled methane digesters that are converting the cover crops into soluble fertilizer, a.k.a. manure. Um, and what is the difference is this made to Gabe's farm? Uh, this is the soil on that patch of land I just showed you, where Gabe has been doing his uh, uh, market garden and then bringing cattle in to graze off the cover crops. This is his neighbor's farm. Uh, the neighbor's farm is, organ is an organic farm, and I don't want to slam organic agriculture, um, but I do want to note that um, the problem with the neighbor's farm is that they till a lot, and that can limit your ability to actually increase soil organic matter. And these kind of practices, well, this basically shows you what Gabe did on his farm. He's taken it from less than 2% organic matter to more than 6% of most of the farm, and in that one field where he had the, the highest amount, up, up over 10%, where he's really got the livestock back into the, into the game. Um, that's more carbon than the native prairie had in the area. We can actually make soils better than they were naturally and do it through agriculture. That's a game changer. That is a philosophical revolution. So the, the way that I summarized this in Growing a Revolution was that the three sort of essential elements for soil building are ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity. It's that simple. And then add cows if you want, add sheep if you want, add livestock if you want. I'm not convinced that animals are necessary to rebuild soil fertility, but I think they can accelerate it. They're another tool in our quiver for actually rebuilding soil fertility. Oops, I'm going backwards again. Um, the benefits that we could get from this are not just maintaining or increasing yields and sustaining them, but it's by reducing fossil fuel use, pesticide use, increasing soil carbon and water retention. Um, it can result in higher f farm profits, less offsite pollution. I have yet to sort of figure out what the downside of restoring fertility to our soils are. I think, I, frankly, I think that what we could use is a national, um, essentially moonshot-like effort to rebuild our agricultural soils and to research what are the practices in different regions, what are the crop rotations, what are the best practices that we could recommend, um, and what are the policies that we would need to do that. Um, and it's not necessarily a question of conventional versus organic. These kind of ideas, I think, can help improve both systems of farming, um, and that we need to think a little bit differently and out of the box in terms of how we do that. Um, finally, there's a very brief way to think about this in the broad sweep of human history. We've already gone through what I call four agricultural revolutions. I think we could be on the eve, or part way into, a fifth. The first one was the idea of planting things in the first place. It changed the course of, of human societies. The second one, second rev agricultural revolution, was the idea of soil husbandry. The idea of planting legumes, the idea of rotating crops. You'll notice that two of those three principles of conservation agriculture are up there now. Crop rotations and diversity. These are old ideas. These are not new ideas. It's ancient wisdom that was adopted in different parts of the world because it worked to help sustain fertility. What we have now is the opportunity to merge the technology that allows us to do no-till with that ancient wisdom and merge modern science and ancient wisdom. But the third revolution was mechanization and industrialization uh, in the 19th century. Few people argue that that wasn't an agricultural revolution. I would say the fourth agricultural revolution was the ongoing biotechnology revolution. I'm going to you know, spare you my thoughts on that today, but this was a real change in agriculture. It boosted yields. It changed the face of things. It was an agricultural revolution, and, and it's either done or not done, depending on which view of the future you want to take. What I think, where I think we are, though, 
is on the eve of a fifth agricultural revolution based on prioritizing soil health and building soil health. And I think it could be applied across the agricultural spectrum and around the world. We just have to figure out how to adapt it and tailor it to different environments, different crops, different economies. What could that do? Well, all these things that are up there that I reviewed before, restoring farm profitability, feeding the world, putting carbon in the ground, reducing off-site pollution, these are all things that would benefit from adopting that kind of philosophy and take. I'm obviously going to recommend my own books. So um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we don't, well, if we do, I'm happy to take some. If we don't, I'm going to be here all day, and we'll talk more about the hidden half of nature and the microbes this afternoon. Feel free to uh, ask me anything all day.